I get it. We all know the famous actors, but it always seemed like a shame to me that stunt performers, the people who do the work to make the movie actually thrilling, are the people we talk about least. Today, we're going to fix that. You'll hear about stunt work and how it's changing for better and for worse. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Okay, can I just be honest with you? When I think about stunts, I think about Tom Cruise, okay? I think about Tom Cruise who's gotten all kinds of famous for doing his own stunt work. And lately, I've been realizing that the reason he's so famous for this is because very few actors actually do that. Like, we really don't appreciate the work and the intensity of being a stunt performer enough. And today, I wanted to tell you about a new documentary that is about all the risks that they take. I knew I was going to be a stuntman. Then I got the best job in the world. Lead stunt double for Daniel on the Potter films. Dave just seemed like a cool older brother. He would do the most dangerous physical stuff. We would do things none thought was possible. What was nice about it was that they all grew up together. Ten years on every film. But it was brilliant. Until it wasn't. So that's a bit of a new HBO documentary. It's called David Holmes, The Boy Who Lived. David was Daniel Radcliffe's longtime stunt double on the Harry Potter movies until he became paralyzed after an accident on set in 2009. So what this movie does is it explores the relationship and the bond that David and Daniel still have. And we wanted to talk about that doc. I want to talk about sort of stunt work um, with two people who have a special understanding of this unique relationship that forms between actors and stunt workers. Kirk Coet is a stunt performer and a coordinator in Vancouver. And Carolina Barchuk is a Toronto-based actor and podcaster. Kirk, Carolina, welcome to the show. What's good, everybody? Hello. Thanks for having us. Of course. I'm happy that you guys are here. Listen, Kirk, let me start with you. You've been doing stunt work for over 25 years now. What changes have you seen in the sector since it, over that period of time? Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, Tom Cruise has a stunt double. He's a good friend of mine. And uh, his name's Chris Gordon, and he does everything about 4,500 times before Tom's allowed to do anything at all. Wow. So all the dangerous stuff. Yeah, he's got the worst job ever because he does something like 100 times to make sure it's absolutely, completely 100% safe. And then Tom steps in and like, I do all my own stunts. It's like, sure, man. Okay. I have and, learned. Um, I'm taking notes. Oh, okay, continue. A lot, of, a lot of times Chris doesn't even end up on camera. So he doesn't get his, his residual for his, his, his uh, performance. Oh, wow. So he's got the worst job ever. Mm. Um, that's a that's a lesson, man. That's a, I did not know that because like I just would have assumed they would go through that process with Tom himself. But this is this is how little we talk about stunt work. I think. Yeah, yeah, we 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 um we all want to believe that actors do our you know do their own stunts. Yeah, it's cool. It's cool if they do. Yeah, yeah. But so how have you how have you just, seen? Can I just say? You, yeah, get in, get in, get sorry, in. Sorry, can I just say something about Tom Cruise? I have this morbid fascination with the fact that he does his own stunts. Um, like you said, your your friend does them all and makes sure that they're safe. But it's actually people don't understand how insane it is that Tom Cruise does his own stunts. Like how unlikely like, that is that you have someone that big. Exactly. Like, um, yeah. The fact that he wants to do his own stunts—that's a whole different question. Like, why? The why do you want to do them? But also it increases the budget of the film by about 20% because they have to put this giant insurance on the film. So normally you pay like $2 million of insurance, but with him, you're paying 20 to $40 million of insurance on every movie he does. Because if something happens to him, the movie's over. The Mission Impossible, the whole franchise is over. So it's, to me, I, I still I still try and imagine what that conversation is between Tom Cruise and his producers being like, yeah, I want to drive a motorcycle off the side of a cliff and then parachute down. And they're like, do you though? Do you really? Must I, you? I'm just fascinated. Yeah, must you though? Well, um, anyway, I'm just absolutely fascinated why he's so obsessed with doing all these dangerous things. Like, dude, we already respect you. You're... You're cool, you're, but you're like Tom Cruise. <laughs> you're Tom Cruise, man. Yeah. Well, he actually, uh, uh, from what I know, he actually actually has his own insurance company, so his own bonding company. So he 
he he he actually uh, insures himself or insures the show so that they can do them. No, hang on. I, I understand. I, I'm I'm conscious of turning this into a Tom Cruise chat, which I don't necessarily want to do. Um, Let's not do that. Let's I mean, I that. generally I want to do that at some point, but maybe today is not necessarily the day for it. But let's get back to, to to the work that you've been doing, Kirk. So you've been doing this for 25 years. You've seen the industry change. How has it changed over that period of time? Well, um, stunt stunt performing came out of the Holly, Hollywood um, Western. Right. That's where it came from. Mm. And generally speaking, it was cowboys. It was rodeo people. It was somebody on set that could ride a horse for like John Wayne because he couldn't ride a horse and nobody knew that. So he had a horse riding double. And mm. and, and so the lineage in North America very much came out of the the cowboy rodeo mentality. And that that mentality continued really up until my career started in the 90s mm. and has has slowly faded since then. Um, now with my generation um, running more of the shows, we we don't have that that kind of mentality. We do care more about people's um, uh, people's brain injuries and things like that. We actually are more educated on on long term uh, physical issues. Yeah. So, but what you're saying is before there was a sort of um, the cowboy mentality, which is to say, like just kind of endure, endure everything over, you know, over like the safety of the performers. How have you seen safety change in that period of time? Do you think? Uh, well, we we still have, you know, we still have accidents. Sure. We, we we're still learning every every time technology changes, something changes. We're we're still learning as as we go, hmm. but. I think overall the the you know the joke used to be like uh you know make sure you land on your head so you don't hurt nothing kid <laughs> you know that was the oh, joke boy. that was the joke um and and it was true back then until we learned that if you land on your head uh, too many times it's a really bad thing yeah uh, yeah Hey, Carolina, I want to bring you in here. When you started landing roles what was your understanding of what stunt work is and how do you think your perspectives changed um, you know, I, I probably didn't know that much right off, off the top. I just mm. assumed someone would take care of it. Um, and as I've progressed, you know, at first I, I wanted to be tough and wanted to do the stunts and wanted to do, you know, the, the little fights and the little, you know, getting knocked over or falling, that kind of stuff. Yeah. But you realize very quickly that that's not very practical, um, you know, I can fall once. Mm -hmm. I can't fall 25 times. Mm -hmm. And that speaks to the athleticism um, and the professionalism of stunt people is that they can fall, make it look really real and painful, but then they'll do it 25 more times because we have to get it from every angle. Mm -hmm. um, so they know how to fall to protect themselves. And also from an actor's perspective, it's not practical because if I break my arm, I, I can't work for the next eight months. Mm -hmm. Even if there's a job for a broken armed actor, I won't get it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really careful about protecting yourself and and making sure that um, you know you're not going to injure yourself and it's not going to hinder your potential for earning money. So let's use that, Kirk, as a sort of a, a springboard to talk about this movie, to talk about this HBO movie. Let's talk about Daniel Radcliffe's stunt double. His name is David Holmes. He was paralyzed on the set of the Harry Potter movie. Uh, when you hear about incidents like these, what's the reaction in the stunt worker community? Well, it's a horrible feeling, of course. Mm. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's an awful, it's an awful feeling that we, we all know that our, our job has these inherent risks, but when, when something something uh something high profile like that hits the news hits the media and you're you know you're on set you're working obviously obviously you know the first thing you do is you feel like oh my god what the heck happened and then and then there's an investigation sort of into what happened and mm -hmm. the the information trickles down and we all we all look at it and say hey how can we make sure that doesn't happen again yeah uh as, as you're a stunt worker you're watching this movie what aspects of the movie resonated with you well, the kids, uh, the kids' story was uh, was similar to a lot of a lot of ours. I started in my early twenties, like twenty three mm -hmm. years old, full time. Um, and then, and yeah, I've been um, I've been on those like the 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 uh, equipment that caused his injury is is one of the most dangerous things that we do. They're called ratchets. And um, you've been on that. You've been on that equipment. You said. Yeah, I've I've 
I've done hundreds or thousands of, of ratchet pulls hmm. and they were really, they were really, um, really big sort of at the height of my performing career. How does it work? How um, does you, if you don't mind explaining a little bit of, I'm just trying to get a visual of it. Yeah. It's like a, it's like an, uh, a, a cylinder and you press a button, it's, it's, uh, it's charged with air and mm. this stroke comes in and essentially you're hooked to a, a solid fixed cable. That's what, that's what we used to do. Mm -hmm. Um, and it propell propels you through the air at high speeds. And I've, I've done, um, I've done a couple that were, um, uh, like 150 feet on a single pick cable and oh, wow. running, running and jumping off of a, a scaffolding and then being caught in the air with the, the wire and getting fired back. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a really violent, um, it's a really violent thing on the body because you're going one direction and then you're going like zero to 70 kilometers per hour and maybe half a second, the other direction. My stomach is turning as you're describing this. Like I'm having like a like literal physical reaction as you're sort of describing what that does to the body. Yeah. It's, it's just very dangerous because once you press the button, if anything's wrong, if anything's been rigged wrong, um, and sometimes if, if it's been rigged right, one, you know, if you have a little bit more load on the cable, it can, it can change the, the, the way the body moves and there's no stopping it once it starts. And so we're, we're phasing out these, these ratchets as much as we can. Um, I think, I think this, this Harry Potter incident, you know, it was, it was one of the reasons, but we've just had so many, so many ratchets go wrong over the, over the years that it's, it's nice mm -hmm. not to be able to uh, have to use them anymore as much as we do. Mm -hmm. Carolina, what, what about you? What was on your mind as you were watching the movie? Um, I kept thinking that, um, this wasn't even a movie about stunt performers, this David Holmes character, what an amazing human being. Mm. He approached his life with so much passion. Um, he approached, you know, working on the films with such passion that you could see that he probably spent every minute of his day of, of his waking day on this set around these actors. Cause he wanted to be there and he loved it so much. And his physicality was unbelievable. The, all the different things that he could do with his body was just, and mm -hmm. I, and Daniel Radcliffe kept saying, you know, I, I wanted to be a stunt man. And, and you get that feeling when you're watching <laughs> David Holmes, you're like, I want to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was really heartbreaking to watch him go through his journey. Um, and I also found that Daniel Radcliffe seems like a really nice guy. Yeah. They, they, have, they have such like lovely tenderness together, don't they? Yeah, they really did. And, and just watching him from grow up from such a young boy into a man <clears throat> and how much love he has for David Holmes and, and how much commitment he has to him um, was really nice to see. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirk, before I let you go, I just wanted to say, it seems like more and more stunt workers are crossing over to become directors. That's kind of been a recent trend, you know? The John Wick movies, directed by a stuntman. Uh, David Leitch uh, directed movies in the Fast and Furious franchise and also Deadpool franchises. Um, Sam Hargrave did Extraction. You yourself have a few uh, director credits under your belt. What do you think it is that makes stunt workers so effective at doing the biggest job on the set? Well, we we design and shoot action for years and years and years. Um, we do all the we do all the prep and shooting behind behind the scenes before it's brought to set. Mm. Um, and a lot of times we have our own set called Second Unit where we shoot all the action out. Um, and frankly, uh, we. We're, we're, you know, that's what we do. That's, that's what puts bums in seats is the action. So when you had, when you had the reins to uh, an action director and you say, make an action movie, it, it's a very different movie than if you hand it to uh, a director that's maybe won some awards and then gets the stunt department to try to hmm. like, communicate with them and figure out what the heck, you know, they want to do that. This, the, the action suffers um, and the box office numbers suffer and Hollywood's now realizing that. So, so more and more uh, stunt people are being being brought in to make some awesome movies. Yeah, it's nice to see. Carolina, thirty seconds to you. What do you make of this recent trend of uh, of, of stunt workers becoming directors? Um, actually, seen it in Canada as well. You have these small independent films um, that couldn't have been made without a stunt director hmm. being made for a million bucks, which is pocket change in in the Hollywood world. Um, yeah. So they can come in and make these really fun action-y films and do it at a low budget and do it safely because they're in charge. So 
I, I got to say, I could talk to you guys about stunt works for some time. I want to talk about Tom Cruise for a much larger conversation. We've got to leave it there. Oh. But in the meantime, Me Kurt Coet, Carolina Barczyk, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Of course. Thank you. Kurt Coet is a veteran stunt coordinator and filmmaker in Vancouver. Carolina Barczyk is an actor and podcaster in Toronto. We're talking about this new documentary, David Holmes, The Boy Who Lived. That is streaming right now on Crave. I'm Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. This is Commotion. Listen, when you think about ground zero for Canadian art, maybe the BAM Center is not the first thing that comes to mind, but for the past 90 years, it has been the place that has trained and mentored a steady stream of people who have become the biggest names in Canadian arts. We're talking anyone from Oscar Peterson to Tanya Tagak. We're talking in every category, from the movies to TV to art to literature to the theater. But here's the thing. Things ah, maybe not going great at the BAM Center at the moment. A few weeks ago, the Alberta government dismissed the entire board. There have been allegations of bullying and harassment. And this has uh, kind of prompted some worries that the BAM Center might be losing its way. Listen, before we get into this conversation, full disclosure, in the next next summer, I'm going to be a faculty mentor for the memoir program that the BAM Center is having. All right, let's get into it. Josh O'Kane is here. He's a Global Mail reporter. He's been following the story. Josh, what's good, homie? Oh, just hanging out. Happy to be here. Hey, I'm happy that you're here. Listen, maybe we start with some context. Maybe we start with this like broader picture. Help me understand, what is the impact that the BAM Center has had in these nine years? More than 100,000 artists have gone through over oh. nine decades. You know, oh, we're wow. talking, you know, both for residencies and yeah. events. You've got people from the likes of Salman Rushdie, Margaret Atwood, Oscar Peterson, as you were saying. Yeah. You know, we've got playwrights, visual artists, musicians, authors. They're coming into take courses or, mm -hmm. you know, if they're maybe, you know, mid-career uh, or, you know, they're going to do residencies or like you, they're, you know, they're teaching yeah. there. You know, the if you pick up a stack of 10 acclaimed books over the last few decades by Canadian <laughs> authors, yeah. you're probably going to see the Banff Center show up yeah. in the acknowledgments. You know, the Banff Center is one of the biggest epicenters of Canadian creativity, where Canadians go to refine what they want to see as Canadian culture. Right. Like, this is the place, right? It like, is. It, everyone seems to be sort of familiar with how the BAM Center has kind of touched um, artist lives. Before we get into this new controversy, let's talk about the fundamental tension, I think, at the heart of the story. Mm -hmm. And that is the central purpose or mandate of the BAM Center. Is it a hub for artists? Is it a corporate retreat? What is this place? What does it want to be? I mean, it started as a hub for artists, uh, but in yeah. this uh, society that we have built, you got to pay sure. for things. Sure. And yeah. they allegedly. Are, yeah, allegedly. Yeah. They're, and they're trying to find ways to pay for the artist's support. So, you know, uh, within the last few decades, you are seeing conferences, um, mm -hmm. you know, and sort of retreats and, you know, bringing people into subsidize these arts programs, you know, mm -hmm. in parts, you know, you are seeing arts funding all over the country, mm -hmm. either, you know, plateau or in the case of Alberta, uh, sometimes it's it's going down. You know, right. the Alberta government did before the pandemic yeah. start a, a gradual lowering of the BAMP Center's funding. Right. And so, you know, when you're trying to be this epicenter of creativity, you've <laughs> yeah. got to find a way to, to pay Literally for keep it. the lights on first. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's a quote on the website, on the BAMP Center website, which and the quote is like, where meetings take center stage. Like, that sort of tells you something about the way that the BAMP Center is trying to present itself to the world. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you want to be a destination in order to make that money. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, this is definitely something that has been a tension for artists right. uh, over the years. But at the same time, I think they, you know, also enjoy the fact that the BAMF Center exists. And I think this is at the, <laughs> yeah. the, the this yeah. is one of the core tensions really in the arts world right now. Yeah. And we're seeing it unfold in real time at the BAMF Center. Okay, so that's the backdrop. That's like sort of the larger questions we're asking. And then all of this comes to a head. What does that look like? So, you know, last October, as you were saying, the Alberta government announces they're going to put a temporary administrator. Uh, his name's Paul Bay. He is the chair of the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. Okay. Um, and he is going to replace the board. The board, the entire board. is yeah. dismissed. So my colleague, Alana Smith, and I try to figure out, well, why would the 
Banff Center and the Alberta government do this? So we started investigating and, you know, we found out there was a harassment complaint filed nearly a year ago by the Banff Center CEO, Janice Price, about its chair, an oil and gas investment manager named Adam Watrous. Okay. Um, we got our hands on the independent investigators report of that complaint and that tells us a lot about the state of the Banff Center right now because this trouble began with the search for a new CEO, Janice Price. She was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, she ran Lincoln Center, Kimmel Center, was the founding CEO of Luminato, a career arts administrator. Um, and she and the chair had a dispute over how she should be involved in the search process. So standard way these things work, the board makes a search committee for a new CEO. The CEO is not supposed to, the old CEO is not supposed to take part mm -hmm. in this process. But in July of 2022, mm -hmm. they expand the search from just arts administrators to the hospitality and tourism sector. Oh, wow. So this is- We're looking at a different- Different pot of people. Yeah. yeah. And this is not them getting rid of the search for arts administrators. Right. But just the expansion prompted some unnamed members of the board, according to the uh, investigators report that we found. Um, and they were concerned about this sort of this pivot to expand. Right. And they approached the CEO, Janice Price, and expressed their concerns and asked if she would take those concerns to the chair. And sure. that is where things got a bit mucky because a CEO, according to good governance, a phrase that I'm sure will make a thousand people turn off their radios, but is important <laughs> to this, yes. uh, you know, it's, a CEO should not get involved. And yes. there was a bit of a tension between the two of them over time. Um, in the end, they did uh, select Chris Lorway, who is the uh, former head of Stanford Live, uh, mm -hmm. sort of a performing arts organization affiliated with Stanford University. Yeah. He's a Cape Breton guy. He's yeah. Canadian. He understands this world. But, um, you know, there's still tension at the board level. The inve independent investigator uh, basically said, and I quote, uh, that the chair had personally harassed the CEO in a bullying-like capacity. Mm. Now, the, the chair denies this. I do need to say that as my little reporter hat sure, comes on. Sure, of course, of course. Um, and, uh, you know, basically you can understand that things were not going well. So even after the old CEO retires, Chris Lorway comes in, there's still some disputes about how all this went down at the board level. And then we got communications from the former chair to the Alberta government that said, yeah. you know, we got to figure out how to run this organization right. Maybe we should, one of the options, he says, maybe we should just dissolve the board. And that's what the Alberta government did. But because, that's how we end up here. And that's how we found out that the sort of, this, again, what people have been describing to me as the soul yeah. of the Banff Center was in question and this sort of this dispute right. like, like brought dispute all this over. to light. Right. And so we were able to, f to determine that because of this investigation. Yeah, it sounds like there's a, quite a big dispute over like the vision of what the BAM Center is for. Listen, we got about a minute left here. Yeah. You've been investigating the story for a while. You've been talking to artists. What are they saying? I mean, like, listen, you know, this being Canada, people don't exactly want to complain out loud too much. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a small place. Sure. But, you know, I've been texting with the playwright, Michael Healy. Uh, he adapted my latest book for the stage, but yes. he also likes commenting on my stories in a more public manner than other artists did. And, <laughs> yes. uh, you know, he said he was there in the late 90s when they began doing the corporate retreats. Uh, you know, the humble buffet he was at, uh, the view through the vast windows was obscured by folks with lanyards. You know, that really frustrated him. He had been at the Banff Center before and has been there since. Sure. But he's wondering about the soul of that. And it comes down to, like, listen, the Banff Center began as a place in a bad economic time during yeah. the Depression to bring theater to the world, to, to make sure the Canadians were supporting theater. And yeah. I think what this shows us is how are we going to fund the arts in a way that is sustainable that keeps Canadian creativity going at these major organizations like Josh, the Banff Center. Josh, I can't believe we did not solve the divide between art and commerce in about 10 minutes or so, but I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your time, oh, man. Happy to be here. Hey, you're the best. Josh O'Kane is a reporter with the Global Mail. He covers the businesses, institutions, economics, and policy that shape arts and culture in Canada. Listen, that's it for the podcast today. Remember, you can listen to the show anytime you like, wherever you get your podcasts. Would you follow us on Instagram? Would you do that? We are at, at Commotion CBC. My name is Alameen Abdul Mahmoud. I'm going to be here tomorrow. If you're going to be here tomorrow, I sure would hope to see you then. <laughs>